You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. The abyss is a literal place. It really exists, okay? It is not a myth. It is not a figment of some writer's imagination. It is a literal place. The idea that heaven and hell are mythological and that heaven is a beautiful island someplace or Shangri-La hanging out in space, that's not what the Word of God teaches. It does not teach that. The teaching of the Word of God is that heaven is a literal place. It's where It's as literal as where we live here. How literal is the Bible when it comes to describing heaven, hell, and the state of the earth after Jesus returns? Today, Pastor Ken talks about the legitimacy of heaven, hell, and the world after God has returned. Heaven is a real place. God is preparing a place for His followers for when He returns. Hell is also a real place. Hell is for those who refuse to place their trust in God. We were separated from God, but He wanted to be with us. So God sent Jesus down to take our place. Because of this, we now can spend eternity with Him. Well, let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Revelations, chapter 9, as he continues his message, War of the Worlds. But the scorpion, you see the claws in front, that's how it catches its, what it wants to eat. And once it catches it, it hits them with that stinger. Now, some scorpions aren't real smart. I've seen it. Sometimes they'll hit themselves in the head. That doesn't end well for the scorpion, okay? That's scorpion suicide. And they do do it, okay? I, I've watched them. It's you're going like, wow, that's a little weird. But the sting is painful, even for us, okay? And certain varieties of scorpions, it can cause fever. It can cause death. Certain varieties can. And scorpions are black, and they're, they're different colors. But when you get a big tropical species, then it's, it, you know, don't mess with them. There are different colored scorpions, black, brown, reddish, yellow, gray, white. Some have stripes. I think I've seen all of them. Uh, they are frequently found, when you, when you find them, they're all over the place. You find them in cracks, crevices, under rocks, in phone booths, under the light at the middle of the night. That's where we used to catch them. Or if you hang a flashlight, anyway, I'm giving my secrets away. They, they're everywhere, okay? And, and literally, we had a, there in Kuwait, we had a huge tank that was for putting out fires in case a fire went through the tent city. But underneath it lived all the scorpions and all the camel spiders. And they'd come out at night. Well, you know, if you have a flashlight, you could catch them. They're everywhere, is what I'm trying to say. I mean, any place you go, there's scorpions. So we have to think, okay, power of as a scorpion has on the, on the earth, well, they're everywhere. Literally. They can be everywhere. Travelers camping in tents or lodging in houses and archaeologists, they all find themselves. I mean, literally, we'd get up in the morning, we'd take our boots and do this, and every once in a while you'd see one drop out. They'd crawl up in it in the middle of the night because it was nice and warm, and you sure don't want to stick your foot on top of one of those. I still do that today. It's a bad habit. I just take my shoes and I put them upside. I just want to make sure whatever's in there is out. But scorpions, by the way, show up frequently in images of cylinder seals found throughout Mesopotamia, throughout the Middle East. And it's believed by many scholars that the scorpion image in the seals represents Ishtar, the goddess of love. The scorpion is also identified as a representative of the underworld in their mythology at that time. We'll get more on this as we get to the description of the creature, but these are some of the things that you see about scorpions right off the bat. Now, to the abyss. The word abyss is a Greek word, and it only shows up in the Bible nine times, just nine times, all in the New Testament. Now, if you're reading the Septuagint, you might find abyss in it, but natively it doesn't show up in the Old Testament. There's no reference to it. And of the nine appearances of the word abyss or abuso, seven, how's that for a number? Seven are in the book of Revelation. From these nine references, there are three deductions that we can make about the abyss. Number one, it's down, not up, 
The direction is down, always is downward. Second, it's never associated with people. It's not associated with human beings. It's always associated with fallen angels, and we'll also see later that the spirit of the Antichrist actually comes from the abyss. So whoever it is that empowers the Antichrist, he's in the abyss, or going to be in the abyss. The Antichrist is conceived by the power of Satan, so he's connected, he's an angelic fallen being, so he's in the abyss. Third is the abyss is actually a holding cell off to the side of Sheol. So we've talked about Sheol, and then we've talked about now the abyss. Oh, wait a minute, that means Sheol's on, on earth too, when you start going the natural extension from that. Am I messing with everybody's worldview? Yeah, probably. But that's what the Bible teaches, okay? So it's a section of Sheol or Hades. It's a temporary place of confinement for fallen angels. Temporary because they're not going to be there for eternity. There's another place for them for that. That's called hell or Gehenna. When demons have been cast out of people, they sometimes spend a period or a temporary period of time in the abyss. That's what the demons that were being cast out by Jesus when he was talking to Legion, they said, please don't cast us into the abyss. They, they didn't want to go there. So he let them go into pigs instead, and they destroyed the economy of pagan worship on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee by killing every pig that was going to be involved in worship. Yeah, so much for that. But it's a temporary place of confinement. Satan's going to be confined in the abyss for a thousand years. And then he goes someplace else. But that means, yeah, Sheol is probably on earth too. Now here's the kicker. The abyss is a literal place. It really exists, okay? It is not a myth. It is not a figment of some writer's imagination. It is a literal place. The idea that heaven and hell are mythological and that heaven is a beautiful island someplace or Shangri-La hanging out in space, that's not what the Word of God teaches. It does not teach that. The teaching of the Word of God is that heaven is a literal place. It's, where, it's as literal as where we live here. And hell is equally as real as where we live right now. I mean, there is no question about that. So here in chapter 9, we see that with the smoke coming up out of this bottomless pit after it's opened, like the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air are darkened by the smoke of the pit, and this is everywhere on the earth, out of it comes locusts with the power of scorpions. That's what John says. He describes, remember, he's describing what he sees in terms he understands in 90 AD. If he had seen Star Wars, he might explain it differently. But he hasn't. So he's describing what he sees in terms he understands. And he doesn't say they were like locusts. He says locusts. Did you catch that? I went and looked at the Greek, three different versions of it. It's the same in all three versions. It doesn't matter. So as soon as you see him referencing locusts, my mind goes to Exodus chapter 10. Exodus 10, 13 to 15 is the plague of locusts that the folks in Egypt have a problem with. So Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt, and the Lord directed an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. And the locusts came up all over the land of Egypt and settled in all the territory of Egypt, and they were numerous. There had never been so many locusts, nor would there ever have been again. They covered the surface of the whole land so that the land was darkened, and they ate every plant of the land and all the fruit of the trees that the hail had left. Nothing green was left on tree or plant of the field through all of Egypt. So after Moses gets done talking and the locusts come, this is what it looks like in the fields uh, around Egypt. Grasshoppers everywhere. That's what a locust is. And they're very hungry. They can clear a field in just a matter of hours, eat everything in it. And if you've, I've actually driven through a bunch of locusts, and I wouldn't recommend it because you lose traction as they all start dying underneath your tires and you start, anyway. But the imagery that John uses, he wants us to remember the plague on Egypt and how God was taking care of the fallen ones who were being worshipped in Egypt. He took care of them, but he's going to do it again. But remember, Egypt was just plants, trees, not people. And nobody understands how the locusts were able to make sure they didn't pick on anything that belonged to Israel, but anyway. But it's also intended to have us remember what's in the book of Joel, too. Joel talks about 
an attack of locusts. And he's using that as a way to talk about what Babylon's going to do. So his prophecy of an impending locust swarm is a little bit more than that. But again, it's, again, it's about damaging crops and the ability to eat. In Joel chapter 2, verses 1 to 9, this is what the prophet Joel says, Blow a trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it's near, a day of darkness and gloom. So he's talking about what's going to be happening with the locusts that are going to be coming. He's also talking about Babylon, and he's also talking about, in typical prophetic language, what we're talking about here in chapter 9. A day of clouds and thick darkness, as the dawn is spread over the mountains, so there is a great and mighty people. There's never been anything like it, nor will there be anything again after it. To the years of many generations, a fire consumes before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but a desolate wilderness behind them. And nothing at all escapes them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses. We're going to see that again. And like war horses, so they run. Well, he's talking about locusts. Or is he? Well, he's talking about the Babylonians. He's also talking about the end of the age. They leap on tops of the mountains like the crackling of a flame of fire consuming the stubble. Like a mighty people arranged for battle. Before them the people are in anguish. All faces turn pale. All run like, they run like mighty men. They climb the wall like soldiers. And they each march in line. And they do not deviate from their paths. He's talking about the way that the locusts are going to operate. They don't crowd each other. They march, everyone in his path. And when they burst through the defenses, they do not break ranks. They rush on the city, they run on the wall, they climb into the houses, they enter through the windows like a thief. So he's comparing locusts like an army. He's also talking about the Babylonians. He's also pointing ahead. And when he starts talking about army, this is, this is what he knows is an army, okay? This is the army of Sargon, of Assyria in uh, Sargon, uh, and this was the CNN of their day, okay? It would take about two or three months for him to carve it out. That's one of the things. But this is what he's seeing, and this is what John's seeing. They're seeing locusts everywhere. But notice how it's everywhere, okay? And that's what, from John's vantage point, that's what he sees coming out of the cloud. He sees something come out of the smoke, and the sheer volume and number of creatures that he sees come out of the smoke appear to him to be locusts, or like locusts, but he, he calls them locusts. So that's what he reports. The volume of these creatures is so overwhelming worldwide that they just literally cover the earth. Your worst vision of zombies, I guess, if you want to look at it that way, you've got locusts everywhere, all at once. And he reports that power is given to these creatures just as scorpions have power. He calls them locusts. There were no other comparable creatures in his vocabulary. But when you start looking at it, and Dr. Henry Morris says, these are not locusts in the entomological type. These are not real bugs. These are demonic. They swarm, they darken the sky, they emerge from the earth like locusts, and they're going to leave misery in their, as they leave, just like locusts. They're not ordinary. These locusts, are like scorpions from the viewpoint that they have the ability to terrorize and debilitate and do so for five months. So these creatures have that same power. Now, one thing we have to remember is back in Revelation chapter 8, in verse 13, then I looked and I heard an eagle flying in mid heaven saying with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth. This is a bad thing for earth dwellers. But for those who are believers in Jesus Christ, this isn't happening to them. But those who don't know him, as he said, they have to have the mark of God, it's, gonna, it's not going to be good. So these creatures, these demonic creatures, are specifically told not to hurt the grass of the earth nor any green thing, whereas locusts normally take out the grass, the green things, the trees. This is different. They're told only the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So if they don't have the seal of God, they're not believers, they're going to get attacked. Now, they're not permitted to kill anyone. Why do we see that? Because they want to kill everyone. That's what they want to do. We'll see with the sixth trumpet judgment that 
they're allowed to do that. But right now, nope, they're not permitted to kill anyone, but they're going to torment them for five months. I mean, it's almost like it's, they get stung or whatever it is, and they start to feel better and they get stung again and stung again and stung again for five months. They're not here to destroy vegetation. These demonically empowered or possessed creatures reflect the nature of the enemy. They hate, and they have to be told, don't kill. They are specifically charged with hurting people. Those who, without the seal of God, we saw that in Revelation 8, 13, people who don't know him, and everyone else who is an earth dweller will be entertaining demonic hordes for five months. So rather, and, and guess what's going to happen? Rather than repent, we'll see that folks won't come to Christ as a result of this. They'll prefer to try and kill themselves, and they'll find out they can't. There'll be a death rate of zero for five months. People won't be able to kill themselves. They're going to want death, but it's not going to be able to happen. It has been given to these demons that they can torment men and impose excruciating scorpion-like stings to debilitate them, but they were also commanded they can't kill cannot kill. Now five months. Why five months? Dr. Morris says there's an interesting time period in Genesis in the flood. Now remember the flood was to destroy all of the problems that were caused by the fallen angels in Genesis 6 to include killing all of the genetic problems that were created by the Nephilim and their descendants and so forth. So verse 1 of chapter 8, God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark, and God caused a wind to pass over the earth, and the water subsided. Also the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed, and the rain from the sky was restrained, and the water receded steadily from the earth. And at the end of 150 days, the water decreased. 150 days on a Jewish calendar is... Five months. Okay? So for five months, the water level did not change. Those Nephilim, those descendants of the fallen watchers, had five months to tread water. And not all of them could. So over that five month period, they all died. And guess who's being released from this prison? the spirits of those fallen individuals who are incapable of being saved, the Nephilim. As you recall, we've seen that the Bible does not say clearly, but it's hinted in other literature that the Nephilim, because they could not go to heaven and they could not go to Sheol, they were demon, They become demons and they're left on earth to cause problems. And those that cause a lot of problems get imprisoned in the abyss. All of them had the same experience of going through the flood. They know what the five months means. So is it possible that it's five months because they're getting vengeance on unsaved mankind? The same ones that they convinced to do what they did in Genesis 6? I mean, it's just it's an interesting number that you can't put a whole lot together. But five months is the same as the five months after the rain stopped for the flood. And uh, I always wonder how many of them were banging on the outside of the ark until, and how long that banging went on until it ended. Don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. Verse 6 of Revelation 9. In those days, men shall seek death and will not find it. They'll long to die and death flees from them. For those people who are being tortured by these creatures, these demonic creatures, there is no death. They cannot die. They get to experience the entire five-month time period. After all the death and destruction that we've seen in the seal judgments, the first four trumpet judgments, for five months there's no death. None. Just misery for those who don't know the Lord. By the way, that also means those who do know the Lord are being left alone for five months. Now, whether or not, because those who are believers know what the Bible says, they're keeping out of laying low and keeping out of sight, or busy going about and helping those who who have been debilitated, we don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But we do know that not everyone is impacted. The believers are not. 
And there will be people who repent as a result of this, but not everyone. And I like what Dr. Walbert says. It's just improbable that any true believer in that day would be subject to the torment of the locusts. And I think Revelation 8.13 clearly shows it's for the earth dwellers only, not for those who love the Lord. So now, now John wants to tell us a little bit about these demonic creatures here in chapter 9. And what we're going to learn is that basically these are scorpion men. Okay? And there's a reason why I say that. Verses 7 to 10. The appearance of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. So immediately you wonder, are they locusts or are they locusts? Don't know. But their appearance is like horses prepared for battle. On their heads appear to be crowns like gold. And their faces were like the faces of men. And they had hair like the hair of women. And their teeth were like the teeth of lions. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots of many horses rushing to battle. And they have tails like scorpions and stings. And in their tails is the power to hurt men for five months. Now, is this something new? Not really. Again, we go taking a look in and around Babylon in that area, and this is a boundary stone of Nebuchadnezzar. It depicts a scorpion man right there. Also a scorpion down below. But the scorpion man has bows and arrows. That is considered a godlike symbol by the Babylonians. It gets a little more interesting. There is a tale that comes from the Babylonian era. It's called Gilgamesh. Okay? And this is from Gilgamesh. The name of the mountain is Mashu, and when he arrived at the mountain range, he being Gilgamesh, which daily keeps watch over the sun, whose peaks reach to the vault of heaven, and whose breasts reach to the nether world below. So he's talking, he's at the gate of wherever the abyss is. Notice who guards it. Scorpion men guard its gates. This is from Gilgamesh, okay? Which is a, just like Hesiod and Theogony, this is the same kind of thing. This is mythology from Babylon. And we get all this description of who it is and what it is. And, and again, we see Scorpion Man again shows up, calls to his wife, talking about Gilgamesh, and his wife answers him. So, I mean, apparently Scorpion Men get married. I don't know. But the thing is, is that here it is, showing up in Babylonian mythology about scorpion men. I think that's intriguing. But what we know this is, is a picture of domination by demons to the extent that men lose their ability to have free choice. They want to die, and they can't. What the scriptures convey here is that in addition to the natural plagues of the first four trumpets, now wicked men are being tormented directly by demons. There's another mythological creature too. We'll see more of it in the next trumpet judgment. It's called a manticore. A manticore is a mythical beast, mythical. It had the body of a lion, the face of a man, and the sting of a scorpion. So again, is this all new? Or has this shown up before? And is what we getting a description of demonic creatures that actually did walk on this planet at one time that are now being held in prison because they should be held in prison. We have no idea what kind of games were going on prior to the flood. We don't know. We really don't know. But we may be seeing that description again. You've been listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken. As you've been listening to this message, you might have some questions about what you've been hearing from the book of Revelation. That's not uncommon. Revelation is one of those books that can cause you to scratch your head and think, huh? That's why it's so good to have resources that can help you navigate the confusing things that our finite minds can't always fathom. If you'd like some additional direction, head over to theunsafebible.com and go to the About tab. There, you'll get a better understanding of what our core beliefs are, and you can even fill out a contact form. Someone can then get in touch with you and try to help answer those questions you have. 
If you're in the Jupiter, Florida area and would like to connect in person, you can look on our website for more details as to where to meet and when. In the meantime, you can find more messages from this series in Revelation by going to theunsafebible.com and looking under the Media tab. Pastor Ken has more fascinating things to share from this book. And be assured, it's no accident that this book is in the Bible. God wants to teach you more about His goodness, His grace, His power, and His authority throughout the prophetic book of the Bible. So be prepared to get strapped in for Prophecy 101 as Pastor Ken continues next time. Our hope is that you'll grow and even be excited for the next edition because of what you learn and are challenged by in the depth of revelation here on the Unsafe Bible.